Hello, hello, hello. This is the fourth uh, presentation of this session, and it's going to be an online presentation by Krzysztof Novak from the Polish Institute of Polish Language, Polish Academy of Sciences. So you will be able to see him on the screen, but only at the end when there are questions, I will repeat them for him. But now I give the floor to him. They, he has a presentation with a very intriguing title, what gooseberries, grapes, and bad wine have in common? So you're going to learn it now. Christoph, the floor is yours. Okay, okay. thank, thank you, you very much for this introduction. I hope that you can hear me. Okay, so, uh, well, in this paper that is co-authored by, uh, by my uh, colleagues as well, we'd like to describe our ongoing work on the integration of, uh, of lexicographic resources. And so, uh, let's talk of resources for Polish this time in the Daria Lab project. And our integration aims at making dictionary data available to scholars for query purposes. We work on a number of research scenarios that, uh, that this great data may be uh, used in. And one of them is research into uh, some problems in diachronic uh, semantics. So, uh, first of all, a few words about the Daria Lab. Project. So it's a large consortium of different and so academics which promises to build an infrastructure for humanities. In within this infrastructure, the Institute of Polish Language is building or it is extending the National Corpus of Polish, but this is a collaboration with the Institute of uh, of uh, uh, well, I'm not sure what's the uh, what's the English name. It is the uh, the Institute of the NLP, uh, the most important institute of the uh, of the NLP in Polish. Then uh, another part is more has more to do with the uh, with lexicography. This is why we are trying to acquire machine readable dictionaries, uh, machine readable representations of. Uh, paper bone dictionaries and then to provide integrated access to them and by integrated access i mean uh, i mean linking them linking them between themselves and external resources but also publishing them online both as a uh, both in the form of a web interface that can be posed by a user but also as a, a api that can be uh, used in automatic uh, automatic research oh sorry i think that i uh, I, I didn't change the, uh, the slide. So here is the slide I was talking uh, about. Again, so our goal is to, as I said before, uh, is to provide integrated, uh, integrated access to research data. And this is also the reason why we are trying to not only uh, to, 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 to provide the data with the web presentation layer, but also try to reflect and try to think, uh, think about how to present data in such a form, in such a format that the scholars could use them in their own, their own research. So as for the resources that we're working on, well, first of all, they are quite heterogeneous uh, resources. So first of all, they are electronic bond dictionaries that are available uh, as a databases in, in a number of formats that simply are not it cannot be uh, cannot be maintained anymore. Then there are between them also paper bond dictionaries, still in paper form that require from us OCR processing and so on. And then there is a number of source data, uh, such as were well, usually paper slips that uh, that were used by lexicographers uh, and are still being used by lexicographers um, you know, to draft dictionaries uh, dictionaries. Uh, dictionary entries. As for the coverage of uh, these lexicographic resources, again, they reflect or they cover uh, a very wide range of a very wide range of linguistic uh, variations. The diachronic dimension. So they start with uh, with uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, you will find the dictionary of Polish medieval Latin or Polish dictionary of the thesaurus, conceptual thesaurus of old Polish. The next, uh, there is a dictionary of the 17th and 18th century Polish, and in with the great dictionary of Polish, which is the most comprehensive dictionary of contemporary uh, Polish up to, uh, up to date. Uh, the same can be said about the diacritic variation, the diastratic variation. 
uh, the strategic linguistic variation. So first of all, you, our, our institute have been uh, publishing for years now, dictionary of Polish dialects, uh, a number of dictionary uh, dictionaries of Polish, Bohutenans, linguistic atlas is usually in collaboration with other lexicographic teams all over uh, all over Europe, and then uh, a bunch of dictionaries of proper names, such as dictionaries of medieval medieval person names, dictionary of Polish place names, and so on, and so on. So, uh, well, the work, as you can imagine, uh, will vary depending on the nature and the character of the resources. So. As far as the uh, as the paper bound dictionaries are concerned, they had to be first authored, uh, and then the text layer had to be uh, structured. Well, this is uh, something. Well, this is a problem that is still not being uh, well. This is uh, resolved, and I think that the lexicographic community has still there is still some work to be done in order to uh, to ensure like the. Uh, like smooth, uh, smooth conversion between paper bound dictionaries and the, and the electronic or machine readable uh, representation. So uh, obviously, each of the lexicographic resources comes with uh, with uh, its own problems or its own idiosyncrasies. Some of them are more about the layer, uh, such as historic, such as the fact that they can use historic scripts, not standard characters. This is the uh, this is the case of the dialectal dictionaries, but they also come with a number of problems, uh, which well, which pose a challenge to the automatic uh, processing and to the harmonizing between them. So first of first of all, they use although they come from the same lexicographic tradition, they are all academic dictionaries of Polish. They present a very wide. A uh, variety of formalisms and notational systems uh, that uh, that uh, that were used in order to encode linguistic uh, information. They also stick to slightly different uh, linguistic, uh, slightly different linguistic theories, which is which can be seen in particular for the dictionaries uh, that started and that have been started in the 50s or in the 90s, for example. Then uh, they concern or they describe non standard linguistic varieties such as historic languages or uh, they also all dialectal varieties of language which makes them difficult or the text that is uh, that they consist of uh, it's all uh, it's very often very difficult to process using the standard uh, the standard nlp tools okay so uh, of course this text or the paperborn dictionaries have to be uh, first modeled or first uh, uh, described uh, in the layout and in the semantics. So here we uh, used the XML, uh, the XML encoding, which was also the way, which was the way that we tried to, which was well, first of all the format that we tried to formalize what we know about these dictionaries, but also uh, thanks to the XML scheme or, or the VRNG and so on, and all these XML. Uh, technologies. It was also the starting point for the subsequent XSLT processing and for uh, for guiding our manual uh, annotators who uh, whose task was to manually correct, proofread, proofread the text of the dictionaries and then to correct them uh, manually. Obviously, since we aim at uh, at integrated uh, integrated access and retrieval of linguistic data, there is a data modeling. Uh, part of this endeavor, uh, since we plan to uh, publish dictionaries as a, uh, as a linguistic open data, uh, there is a uh, there is an important uh, data modeling step involved. Obviously, as you can imagine, such a way uh, such a wide variety of of resources um, requires from us first of all using like the all the the entire uh, the, the very rich now the very rich uh, framework of uh, of uh, Lemon and Lemon related uh, ontologies, but also we need to model bibliographical data, quotational data, and so on and so forth. So, this is quite a difficult task and one that hasn't uh, been uh, finished yet. And as for the data input part, well, uh, it all starts by importing the databases, XML and relational databases to the CRAP database. Next, the data are cleaned and reduced to because we are interested in only a subset 
optimistic data in further than then. Next, this, this harmonize all these, um, uh, this, this harmonized data are next imported into a, in a semantic, say, let's say, semantic web uh, database, and next we try to map between them. However, this work is of a preliminary character in this particular uh, project. As I said before, the first test showed us the extent of inconsistency that exists between dictionary sources. At the same time, it also showed us that uh, showed us some promises, such uh, such such uh, the research based on the lexicographical data uh, may provide us with. And in order to understand better this data and also to show what they can be used uh, for, we came up with a number of research scenarios that we be believe may be relevant to any linguist working on Polish, but also uh, on Polish. So in this paper, we focus on regular polysemy of plant names in diachronic perspective in two dictionaries that uh, that uh, covered old Polish in the period up to 15th century and the, the electronic dictionary of the 17th and 18th century. Uh, century Polish. Why plant names and why the, uh, well, first of all, as you can see from, uh, from the uh, title of this talk, plant names form a relatively small set of axioms that are also routinely systematically very difficult to represent in a dictionary for, for, a, for, for, for a number of reasons. They also force a number of methodological choices on the part of, uh, of lexicographers, choices that are um, uh, very often all but uh, obvious. Plant names are also quite special in that they are phenomenon that is located somewhere on the boundary of linguistic and real world uh, knowledge. And this is also which opens them to mapping to semantic uh, web resources such as Wikipedia and others um, uh, and, and, others, uh, and other resources of the uh, other, yeah, along the resources. What, what is important, what was important for us that there exists an intensive research into plant names from both synchronic and diachronic perspective. And they also offer a very nice case study for diachronic semantic research because they present some stable properties in Polish uh, across the time, but also uh, in cross-linguistic perspectives. And one of them is regular policy. So uh, as a quick reminder, I will refer to this paper this this uh, classical paper by Akrasian from the 74, so regular polysemy uh, of the word A with the meanings A, 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 AI and AG is called regular if in the given language there exists at least one or other word, one other word B with the meanings BI and BJ, which are semantically distinguished from each other in exactly the same way as AI and AG, and if AI and B, uh, BI and AG and BJ are non Synonyms. Well, it's much more difficult uh, than uh, well. Well, it's uh, it's a quite an intuitive, uh, intuitive uh, phenomenon. If you look closer in it, then here you will have uh, here on the slide you will find an, an example that is provided by Atkins and Randall in the uh, in the uh, handbook of lexicography. So there is a number of uh, of in, uh, of systematic mappings from, let's say, animal names, such as there is a squirrel, to some, or there, there is a regularity between sessions among some of the next things. So animal or names of the animals will be, for example, very often used for the name of its meat, don't eat squirrel. And as Atkinson found the phrase it, such interwoven relationship ships are of immediate interest of lexicographers. However, what theory, what lexicography theory doesn't agree on is how and if, uh, to what extent such phenomena should be represented in dictionaries. And from our study, from our analysis, uh, it's, we could draw a conclusion that, uh, that like, like lexicography, lexicography policies on this problem uh, also vary the law across uh, across years. So, uh, first of all, uh, a word about the markers of regular polysemy in the dictionaries. 
Well, the most uh, the most obvious one you know, are kind of innovative and destructive conjunction. So, for example, in the in a definition for OT, we find uh, a word plant or brain. There is also a, 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 another a, another important marker of retinal polysemy, which are aneurysmic expressions. So, for example, in the mentioned for P or P's, you will find the, the you will find an aneurysmic expression. Uh, this. Brains. And then, obviously, in some modern, more, more modern dictionaries, uh, you will find such polysemy, uh, such polysemy being uh, rather treated uh, distinctively as a separate census rather than uh, lumped into a single definition. So, obviously, these markers are all about certain or all about certain. Um, Markers of polysemy. So uh, our automatic, uh, automatic, um, uh, automatic processing, and then automatic um, uh, pattern uh, detection in uh, in the sense definition needed or required manual uh, annotation, manual an uh, analysis. Since since even the most simple, uh, the most since the most simple markers such as uh, such as uh, alternative conjunctions may be uh, confusing or are polysemous uh, in the uh, in the use. So, for example, in the in the entry pochnien, which is the uh, English hop, you will find two words plant or fruit, which can be uh, can be regarded as a types of uh, types of polysemy or regular polysemy, which is not. However, this case isn't the same as another one, which is which is a word that I, uh, which is a word that had been uh, had been historically used to refer to two different plants, uh, different plants. However, the lexicographer doesn't distinguish between uh, between both of them. So, uh, so. so um, Thanks to the automatic processing and the automatic analysis, we were able to detect uh, or to uh, to detect three major uh, three major polysemy or regular polysemy uh, polysemy patterns in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Polish uh, in both old Polish and then 17th and 18th century Polish, and both and all three patterns are productive in this historical. Uh, period. So, as you can see, obviously, these two, uh, the, the, the patterns can be uh, can be further uh, distinguished in more fine grain types. So, for example, plant X brother of plant X type can be further distinguished into plant X flower of X uh, type, which is typical of ornamental plants. Now, there is presidential tree, which uh, which uh, which is uh, systematically mapped to fruit of X. In the second example, you can see that the definitions uh, concern two distinct maxims that display the same behavior in the polysemy, uh, however. Uh, then there is another example, the example serial grass X, which is, uh, which is systematically mapped to the name of grains of X. This is a typical example. However, it shows that we need to be very careful, careful when drawing conclusions from resources that are still to be completed. The second dictionary, so the electronic dictionary of 17th and 18th century, is simply all provides a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, dictionary entries which are not completed. Uh, still completed. Okay, so this five minutes uh, were very quick. Uh, quickly passing. Again, another group of lexemes are plant X product make uh, of X and then and then plant X group of X. This is a this is a quite a curious uh, pattern of polysemy because as you can see in the second example, again a, a very careful manual annotation is required here as very often as very often what seems to be the case of the same you know, pattern of uh, of uh, regular polysemy, in fact, isn't uh, isn't one. So, for example, uh, you can distinguish between uh, between polysemy terms referring to bushes, so to groups of uh, indistinct groups of certain plants that are similar to a plant that is uh, at the origin of a certain name, and then uh, and then groups uh, such as forests, which are usually to be believed to be uh, to be composed uh, in majority uh, or entirely of a plant of certain 
type. Okay, since we have no time, let me enjoy, let me turn to very quickly to conclusion to some perspectives that would be really very interesting for uh, this research. So first of all, the automatic analysis isn't entirely reliable. First of all, for the the reason for that is the quality of the data. So the dictionary is obviously varying the granularity and the quality of uh, of description. Another thing is that the quantitative analysis of dictionary entries is uh, needs some um, uh, uh, needs to be approached carefully because it will needs to be uh, needs to be very careful since the fact there is no evidence for certain phenomenon doesn't mean that there was no linguistic uh, even this is a this is a general problem of historical linguistic that was already uh, nicely in, uh, summarized by Labov. Uh, in the uh, next identity, well, what uh, is interesting for us is uh, going even further and identifying major patterns of regular polysemy and then in quantifying the productivity and changing categorization of, uh, of the word. We also think uh, and we expect that at the, uh, at the end of the project, we will be able to provide users with, uh, with uh, dialectal data since language change is very often uh, preserved in dialectal, uh, dialectal varieties. And then what's very interesting and promising is comparison with contemporary Polish, which will shed more light on, uh, on the productivity and dialectal and productivity of certain uh, polysemy, uh, polysemy patterns. Obviously, what would be great would also would be also to, uh, to feed this database with cross-linguistic uh, data so we could see or, or compare uh, or compare the resources uh, cost linguistically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. I apologize for the lower quality of the sound, but you still had about 25 people here in the room who listened to your talk, and I invite you to have questions. There are questions here in the Zoom. Are there any questions online? Don't have any, uh, so there, there's nobody here. And I would like to ask, uh, have you followed any similar research uh, in other language, like in other Slavic language, or what their, what their results were? Yeah, I hope that I, uh, that I have understood you. I need to, I need to turn it uh, uh, Okay, so uh, no, we haven't, we haven't done this research, uh, as I said, uh, as I said at the uh, uh, at the end of my talk, we believe that would be uh, that would be a very nice thing to have. So to compare uh, to compare the policy, I mean, uh, patterns between the languages. Where well, obviously there is a lot of research uh, going on at the moment. Uh, first of all, uh, national uh, national or cross linguistic uh, what um, can be used to this uh, to this purposes, but still. These are usually the words that's of contemporary languages, and what would be very nice and very interesting would to be would, would to be you know, to assess the uh, to assess the diacritic dimension of the uh, of this policy and partners, since we are very much uh, excited about uh, excited about uh, trying our capacity to make cross linguistic research. I see. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question here now in the room? Anything else? No one. So then I think that's it. Thank you, Krzysztof, once again. And we will have now time for a coffee break. So thank you very much, everyone who has come here. And now is the end of this session. See you next time. Thank you, Krzysztof. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye